An old story from the long-haired 70s tells about a hippie who decided to search for truth. So he traveled around the world and with his backpack climbed the tallest mountains of Tibet and finally sat down cross-legged with a group of like-minded people who waited to hear the great words of wisdom from a self-appointed guru wearing a tie-dyed t-shirt. About four hours passed while no one said a word, nothing but dead silence. Finally, the guru cleared his throat, looking around at the eager faces and said, life is like 10 tennis balls floating in a bowl of cherry jello. Then he lapsed back into silence. The group just sat there, thinking about it. Another hour of dead calm. Well, there had to be more, but nobody had the courage to speak or ask. So at last, our friend timidly raised his hand and said, uh, why is life like 10 tennis balls floating in a bowl of cherry jello? The guru just stared at him in disbelief through the smoke and the incense. And then he replied, Hey man, did you come here to learn or to argue? <laughs> Paul, as he writes to the new believers struggling to maintain their infant faith in that Las Vegas-like city of sensual pleasures, Corinth, confesses to them in chapter 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. All through the chapter, he frankly admits, I know that the story of Calvary is sheer lunacy to people who don't get it, who haven't experienced it for themselves. Here in Corinth, this city of philosophical pondering and classical Greek wisdom, the concept of a man dying on a cross for others, it's madness. People see it as insane. That's what we're up against. Is it still like that today? The concept of the cross has spanned the globe and penetrated virtually every nation. Millions of churches have crosses on them. Everywhere humanity exists, people have heard the idea of a man named Jesus Christ dying for the human race. Almost everywhere that we see Coca-Cola signs, we also find a Gideon Bible. In much Western culture, the cross is built in. And yet even today, good thinking people, scholars, even theologians, decide that the message of the cross is foolishness. A clear word paraphrase of the Bible interprets verse 18 this way. Those who have bought into this world's philosophy see the preaching of the cross as foolishness. C.S. Lewis wrote in his Mere Christianity about the meaning of Calvary and about the philosophical explanation that Christ had volunteered to bear a punishment instead of us. Quoting, On the face of it, that is a very silly theory. If God was prepared to let us off, why on earth did he not do so? He then goes on for the next 132 pages to explain some of the why, at least as it appears to him. But he's absolutely right that many people hear the story of the cross and mutter to themselves, that's dumb. What will weak-minded people come up with next? Talk about religion being an opium of the people. We've already mentioned that Corinth was a place where liquor flowed and sex cheerfully offered itself on every street corner. It was a culture, though, in which human reasoning and debating were favorite pastimes. The historian Aristides reported that one constantly met so-called wise men who had their own solutions to the world's problems. Every street corner had its streetwalkers and soapboxes. Waxing eloquent was a common pursuit. From the point of view of Greek wisdom, the idea of a cross on it? No way. People hooted in derision at the very suggestion. 
the new Christians wanted to reach several groups there in Sin City. Fellow Jews, of course, but what was their mindset? They were still expecting a triumphant king, a leader who would parade down Main Street. Following a martyred teacher who'd been executed on a cross? Talk about foolishness. To the Greeks living in Corinth, the message of the cross also made no sense because of their human philosophies. And of course, to both the Greeks and the Romans living in that culture, a cross was the ultimate symbol of disrepute. It was a shameful way to die, one used as a psychological instrument of terror. One commentator notes, Greeks and Romans were sure that no reputable person would be crucified. So it was unthinkable that a crucified criminal could be the savior? But what lesson is there for us today? Well, first of all, it's certainly possible to be too wise. You can argue until your face turns blue and spin 50 arguments on the head of pins, grind others into mincemeat with your A through Z debate points and be completely and absolutely wrong to those watching from heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, has Paul quoting from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, I, God, will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Now, the context of the quote has the kingdom of Judah having just sought an alliance with Egypt after being threatened by King Sennacherib of Assyria. It was a wise move politically from a human standpoint. The pundits of Judah thought it was shrewd. But God in heaven, who controls everything, didn't think so. From his vantage point, he knew it was anything but wise for his people to trust in treaties instead of in him. Paul now writes in verse 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Here's the good news for today. The cross may seem like a tired cliché, a foolish trinket people wear around their necks. You watch Christians and wonder, along with the happy hour citizens of Corinth, what can they be thinking? But for those who have experienced the reality of the cross in their own lives, Calvary is anything but foolish. For those who've been set free from their drug habits and their addictions and their fears, the message of the cross isn't foolish. It's the wonderful good news we call the gospel. Back in verse 22, Paul shakes his head and writes, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. In our own quiet moments of reflection, we have to ask ourselves, what are we looking for? Are we always casting about for an excuse to reject the cross? Do we want a miracle or a perfect church family or a hypocrite-free denomination before we'll finally accept Jesus Christ? Do we look for a faith that stands up to the secular logical debate points of CNN? Or are we willing to hear the rest of Paul's verse? Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A Bible commentator observes that the crucified Christ is the power that saves and the wisdom that transforms seeming folly into ultimate and highest discernment. Thank you.